Hello, I'm Peter Towers, Managing Director of ESS BizTools. Welcome to the ESS BizTools Business Advisory Services Podcast. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, how we have uh, viewed 2021 and give you an indication as to what we see as the real issues for accountants, business advisors, bookkeepers and chief financial officers supplying services to SMEs should be thinking about in, as we approach 2022. So first of all, what happened in 2021? Obviously, we had COVID-19 lockdowns, border closures, lack of international visitors and tourists, lack of people being able to freely move around this great country of ours. So there's no doubt that 2021 continued the same problems for businesses and for the accounting industry as what we had seen in 2020. Hopefully the fantastic response from the Australian people relative to the vaccine jabs means that we will be able to accommodate whatever new occurrences occur through COVID-19 as we move into 2022. But more of that later. The ComBank Accounting Market Pulse Report that was released in May 2021, their latest edition of the report, indicated that 95% of the accountancy firms that they surveyed all around Australia, small, medium, large firms, no big four firms though, 95% of those firms were committed to diversifying services over the next two years, 95%. The top rating new service line was identified as business advisory services. And it's going to be interesting what happens over that two year period. We're about one third of the way through. What's your firm doing? in properly implementing business advisory services. The Australian Financial Review in September reported that there'd been a 125% increase in capital raising, utilizing crowdsource funding equity raising. The amount raised in 2020-21 was $46 million by 65 companies. This brought the total capital raising by crowdsource funding equity raising companies since the inception of crowdsource funding equity raising in 2018 to over $100 million. So some companies are very happy. One of the leading crowdsource funding intermediaries, Equitize from Sydney, announced that it takes fewer than 5% of the hundreds of companies that reach out to them each year. Fewer than 5%. What caused that? This means that 1,550 companies never got a Guernsey to get into the capital raising game. Let me repeat that. 1,550 companies approximately that applied to a crowdsource funding equity raising intermediary were not even able to get into the game of being able to raise crowdsource funding. They never got a Guernsey. They had no chance. Why? What went wrong? Did those companies go off and talk to a crowdsource funding intermediary without having any discussions with their accountants? Can you believe that? 
I can't. But if they did, why did they do it? Andrew Geddes, a well-known accounting industry consultant, believes that this is probably what happened because a large number of accountants have basically been indicating to SMEs they're not interested in doing anything else, even though the Accounting Market Pulse Report survey has indicated that 95% of the firms surveyed were going to diversify services. So did these 1,550 company directors believe that accountants were not interested in helping them? I hope not, but that was, that's what the figure seems to indicate to me. Are accountants tell, telling their clients that diversified services doesn't include supplying services like the preparation of business plans, budgets, cash flow forecasts, and projected balance sheets? That accountants are not interested in mentoring clients on corporate governance issues? I can understand if some accountants are saying that we don't know enough about crowdsource funding equity raising to be able to advise clients on what's involved, what the role of the crowdsource funding intermediary is. But we wrote material on that and promoted that three and a half years ago. So I think accountants, if you're interested in finding out this information, I can assure you the information's available. So let's just go through this list again. What should these people have done? 95% of the people who were interested in raising capital up to $5 million in 12 months obviously did not have the basic requirements, a business plan, budgets, cash flow forecasts, projected balance sheet. They would also need a market report, and I know that's not prepared normally by accountants, and they need a marketing plan prepared by a marketing consultant. They also need a leadership team that's got some vision and a fire burning in their belly of wanting to achieve things. I think they need a overview on corporate governance issues which I believe accountants should be able to supply to them. And they need an understanding of the crowdsource funding intermediary's role. And they should have an awareness of the crowdsource funding offer document that has to be prepared. Now, if you're listening to this and saying, well, I don't know anything about crowdsource funding equity raising or the offer document that's required, and I'm not particularly interested in finding that out, that's okay. Just contact me, please, and we can organise those sort of services to be supplied to your clients, either by some of our other subscribing firms around Australia, or if you don't want to go to firms in your location, you can refer the client through to me, and we will um, undertake that work I got no interest in doing any other work, especially taxation, uh, none at all. So my challenge to you as an accountant is that surely one of your real challenges in 2022 should be to ensure that any client that you have who has an interest in being able to raise capital, you will be able to assist them that at least your clients will come and talk to you so that you know that they are interested in raising capital so that you can have a conversation with them and honestly work out whether you can assist them and whether you think they've got good prospects, of course. And if you think they need to take a little bit longer to get better prepared, that'd be good advice. Because this is a tremendous waste 
of resources that those 1,550 companies have suffered. They must have had some planning. They must have some sort of business. They've suffered a tremendous embarrassment, haven't they? At the very least, going off and talking to an intermediary, whether they've done it in person or by Zoom or by telephone, and then to be told that they basically haven't got the basics right. Now, I think our aim as a profession should be that at least 80% of the companies who contact an intermediary should get a Guernsey to get into the game. Should have the opportunity of having a conversation with an intermediary and getting some real feedback on what their business proposition is. Not to be told they're not even going to be selected for any team that's been selected if we go back to a football sporting type comparison. I think that's a worthwhile aim for our profession because there's a lot of potential work out of helping these companies. And just to refresh your memory, these are companies that can have turnovers up to $25 million per annum. They can raise up to $5 million from the public by issuing of ordinary shares. They don't have to offer security to those investors who are obtaining shares. Obviously, there's no personal guarantees have to be issued by the directors and there's no monthly repayment of principal and interest. There's significant work opportunities for accountants in the preparation of these key documents. And hopefully, you will bring yourself up to speed with things like corporate governance and the overview of crowdsource funding equity raising, in particular, the duties of the intermediaries and then equip yourself with the knowledge that you could coordinate the preparation of the crowdsource funding offer document and help your client in the negotiations with the selected intermediary because your client selects the intermediary they wish to deal with. There are 16 intermediaries that have been appointed by Australian Security Investment Commission Only four or five of them are very active, but the others are there. So there's plenty of organisations that your clients can go to. I'd like to see these intermediaries flat out, the whole 16 of them, handling two, 3,000 companies' applications a year, and that they've accepted 80% of them. I think that's what the aim should be. And as a profession, we should be committed to communicating this to all of our clients so that they understand that accountants can assist them and they don't have to go through this sincere problems that they would have encountered. Issues for 2022. In our various podcasts and webinars that we've been presenting over the last two months, We've tried to raise issues that we think are very important for you to consider as we look at not only 2021, but with an eye to the future, 2022, which one of our speakers in our podcast from the University of California, Los Angeles, indicated will be a boom year, 2022. He made the comparison of what happened way back, none of us were around, in 1920 at the end of the Spanish flu pandemic that 20 million people lost their lives from. 2020 was a great new period of business expansion. It's what created the saying, the, the roaring 20s. 
Unfortunately, it was followed by some real problems in 1928, which heralded in the Great Depression. Hopefully, the boom years that I'm referring to are not going to be followed by that sort of problem again. But there's going to be some work challenges for accountants, not just in the taxation arena, but in the business development areas. And that's what I want to refer to now, if I can. A few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of having Andrew Geddes speak to me in a webinar and later on in a podcast. Andrew, of course, was one of the joint founders of the Financial Management Research Center, which was then at the University of New England at Armidale. And I knew him a long time ago. And he then went on to become a very successful public company director and was chair for 10 years of a company that started 30 years ago as a one veterinary surgery practice in Townsville and grew to become a top 200 ASX company on the Australian Stock Exchange, and that is Green Cross. And for the last 10 years, Andrew was the chair of that company. About 15 years ago, Andrew Geddes encouraged the CEO of Green Cross, Dr. Glenn Richards, who was the founder of the company, to take the leadership team to America with Geddes. And they studied the theory and concept of scaling up. And they then came back to Australia and introduced that to Green Cross. And that was what propelled them to become a top 200 ASX company. Geddes, of course, is a keen supporter of the concept of scaling up. In the uh, discussion that I had with Andrew, his comment was that scaling up process should be implemented by accountants to assist in the development of younger accountants by giving them the opportunity to work with experienced accountants directly with senior executives of the client organization so that they develop the all important skills and gain greater appreciation of what the accountant's role is so as to help with retention of accountants in accounting firms and the attraction of other accountants to work in accounting firms. After Andrew had made this comment, I said, accountants have been under a lot of pressure in the last 12 months. Do you think that this could be phased in over the next six months? And then he answered, you've got to start it now, this afternoon because your greatest challenge at the moment as accountants is getting good people to work with. You've got to start it now, this afternoon. I, I wonder how many people have done anything since Andrew made those comments about six weeks ago, but I would urge you to think about it and to go on to our podcast, which are available on www.essbistools.com.au and uh, you can listen to the podcast or obviously you can listen, listen to them on your mobile phone or other device. Mark Holton, a director of Smith Inc and a very experienced accounting practitioner and technical advisor to accounting firms also participated in one of our uh, podcasts. In fact, Mark has participated in a number of our events over the last 12, year, uh, 12 months that we're grateful for. Probably was over 12 years with other things, of course. His comment was, most firms do not have systems for the delivery of business advisory services. It tends to be a one-off job. Mark then said that the preparation of a budget or a cash flow forecast is an ideal opportunity for accountants to suggest to a client 
that a quarterly business review meeting process should then be introduced to enable the analysis of quarterly financial accounts to measure the performance against the budget and cash flow estimates progressively during the year. In other words, Mark's saying, put it into a system and get some ongoing value from it. You need to raise these issues with your clients, sir. You're the expert on financial matters. Convey to the client why it's so important to be having regular meetings because you've introduced a system. I then interviewed Amanda Gascoigne. Amanda Gascoigne runs a business these days called Amanda Gascoigne Consulting from the very uh, beautiful Port Stephens area north of Newcastle in New South Wales. Amanda was an accountant in Maitland in the Hunter Valley for 18 years prior to becoming a consultant. Amanda said that she thinks that small accountancy firms and medium-sized firms, which are the key group that she advises, need to have systems. And if you've got the systems, you will get extra work, but you must be prepared to be reactive to what your clients are seeking. How many clients ring up and ask you to talk to them about doing some extra taxation work for them? Or to talk about the intricacies of changing how you prepare the annual accounts? From my experience, which was 24 years as senior partner in a accountancy firm, I don't think you would have got too many wanting to talk to you about those things. So what Amanda's referring to is clients that want you to do more commercial work. It might be an analysis of their debtors because they suspect their debtors days outstanding are too high. It might be to review their cash flow forecasts because they never seem to have any money. It might be to understand the risks that they are running by not understanding the personal property securities register because they might have heard that one of their competitors has been caught up in a problem on the crowdsource funding equity on, on sorry on the um, lack of knowledge of personal property securities register so food for thought the next um, speaker that i've uh, had the pleasure of interviewing and discussing matters with was paul barnaby now paul's the regional integration consultant asia pacific for plan guru i've got to know plan guru very well over the last few years and have had quite a number of conversations with one of their founders and directors trip graham who lives in california and i'm very impressed with the packages that that company has produced because they're exclusively concentrating on the preparation of budgets, cash flow forecasts, and projected balance sheets. Paul's a chartered accountant. He was the senior partner in a um, firm in New Zealand, in Auckland, a second tier firm. But 20 years ago, he saw the light and decided that he wasn't interested in being involved in traditional accounting any longer. He wanted to concentrate on predicting the future so he could help businesses plan so that they could see what the financial outcome would be of the deliberations, the decisions that they're making today. In the podcast, Paul said, too many accountants don't involve their client in the planning process, which commences with the business plan and proceeds through to the predictive accounting reports of budgets cash flow forecasts and projected balance sheet without effective communication with the client. Predictive accounting is documenting the future accounting periods. Sorry, I'll reread that. Predictive accounting is documenting for future accounting periods, what we have been doing in the historical accounting process. 
but software tools are now available to the prep for the preparation of three in one financial forecasts, which enable the future financial position of the business to be clearly documented. Now that's great work that you can be preparing. We have a joint venture with Plan Guru and with Paul Barnaby's Beyond Accounting Technologies, whereby he will coach your team in how to effectively use these tools, including some of the ESS Biz Tools products, to be able to calculate effective budgets. If you need details, please contact me. Priscilla B. Smith made the comments. We joined ESS Biz Tools five years ago as a subscriber, and we have never looked back. So Priscilla is a very happy subscriber utilizing our services. She said, it's an amazing set of products and tools that we utilize with our clients, but we also utilize the system to guide young accountants in our mentoring program that her business, Cloud9 Associates, conducts in Brisbane so that these young accountants can better understand the challenges of delivering a wide range of non-compliance services to SMEs. Priscilla went on to say, ESS Biz Tools enables us to empower young accounting professionals with tools and knowledge to achieve their goals. I then asked someone completely different, someone who's been a user of accounting services for over 40 years. His experience is in communications. He's been an executive, a trainer, a coach, a presenter in TV and radio. He owned a string of radio stations in regional Queensland at one stage. His name's Brad Smart. He's the uh, author of Selling the Message, which if you want an easy to read book that helps you understand how to communicate, get a copy of it, Selling the Message. Brad Smart said accountants need to fill up the hopper by keeping marketing going to keep the hopper filled up because every experience, every business experiences clients dropping out of the bottom of the hopper for all sorts of reasons. And if you don't keep topping it up and you just arrogantly go along and say, I've got plenty of business, I don't need to worry, clients will drop out at the bottom of the hopper to the point that you are no longer viable. So the message that Brad Smart is giving the accountancy profession is that you have to communicate on an ongoing basis, not just when you think that you might need to do some topping up because he said, you never know when people are going to fall out of the bottom. Now I know some accountants are discussing and deliberating as to whether to continue to have subscriptions to various packages and products that have been designed to assist you in the delivery of your services. Brad Smart's comments were that when you are very busy, like some of you are telling me you are at present, that is the time you continue to look for the topping up process to continue into the hopper because you never know when you're going to lose people by uh, them dropping out of the bottom. Hopefully that's food for thought that you might like to consider. ESS Biz Tools is very much aware of the requirement for business advisory services to be delivered to the SME community in Australia. And we're very much aware that you need systems. In fact, we have known that for the 20 years that ESS Biz Tools has been selling product packages to accountants all over Australia, all sizes. 
we've always built it around a system that is embedded in the 32 separate product packages that we have available. These packages include the SME needs analysis, which was originally developed by Andrew Geddes when he was at the University of New England. And we've, with Andrew's approval, expanded it a fair bit over the years. But it's the key document because it gives you some discussion points to sit down with a client or a prospect to have a cup of coffee and discuss some issues and to find out what really worries the client. What wakes them up at 3 a.m.? What are they concerned about in their business? But these are business issues. Some of it might be taxation, of course, how much tax they're paying and future planning built around a capital gains tax issue or something like that. But in the main, it will not be compliance issues that the client's waking up at 3 a.m. about. It'll be other issues. It could be succession. It could be selling the business. It could be buying another business. It could be cash flow management. It could be dead as days outstanding. It could be that they want more accounting services. They might like you to supply a virtual CFO service because they're growing. It might be they'd like to raise some capital using crowdsource funding. Or it could be a very young company. It mightn't be young executives or directors, but a young company that's undertaken research and development and now is looking at raising capital, looking at accelerating commercialization grant and potentially trying to raise capital as an early stage innovation company. Or perhaps it's a tradie business that for years has just Guess the figure for a charge out rate. Listen to what competitors are charging. No idea whether it's been calculated on the basis of what his firm really needs to make a targeted profit. Or it could be a professional service firm, an engineer, architects, town planners, quantity surveyors, accountants, solicitors. What's the basis of determining their charge out rates? They got any bearing on productivity, on the salaries being paid, on the overhead being incurred by that business, on the targeted profit. So you could supply all these services. Business health checks, personal property securities register. I don't like it, but it's there. It's the law. And your clients need to register assets if they wish to protect them. Now, it doesn't apply potentially to every business. I accept that but it does to a lot. And in my reckoning, there's been over $450 million lost by Australian businesses. The majority of the losers have been small businesses. But it's interesting to note that the biggest single loss was $65 million by the subsidiary of a top 100 international group. $65 million was lost by a subsidiary in Western Australia of a top 100 international group from the USA. So if the big end of town can make the mistake of not understanding the legislation, what chance have your SME clients got? So I think you should be very much aware of it. Make sure your key clients that could be affected by this legislation know about it. We take you through it. Business plans. We've talked about business plans a couple of times in this podcast, but they're vital for businesses. They're like maps for tourists. They need to know where they're going and they need to have some reference points that they can measure back what their progress has been. Just like you do if you're taking a drive through unknown countryside. You've got some idea where you're trying to head to for lunch, for afternoon tea, for dinner, for a bed that night. Buying a business, selling a business, succession planning. So there's some of the uh, issues that ESS Biz Tools will supply to you. All pre-prepared systems built in place. So all you've got to do is read the material and then start presenting it. So the challenges for 2022, as I see them, 
He's offering value added services to your clients. Communicating with your clients, making sure they realize that you can supply these services. Not like that 1,550 odd businesses, the 5% only were accepted. And the other 1,550 were rejected by the intermediaries through what I can only describe as lack of preparation. I bet those clients didn't think that they got value added services. I hope they actually didn't go to accountants for those services, but why didn't they? Do they think accountants aren't interested in helping them? I hope that's wrong also. A lot of unanswered questions here, isn't there? This work will give you added value for your clients, obviously, but it will also create interesting and challenging work for your team members. And let's go back to what Andrew Geddes was talking about. You need to motivate young accountants. They're a bit different to some of us older people. They're living in a world that's got far more challenges and opportunities. And gee, with what's likely to happen in 2022, I think you're going to have great competition coming from accounting firms who are already fully committed to business advisory services, who will be looking to hire accountants who can deliver. And we're going to have competition from industry and commerce and government probably, who will be gearing back up to meet the challenges of 2022. So Andrew Geddes proposes that you Utilize the scaling up process. You take young accountants with you to meet the executives of the clients, not just the bookkeepers, but the executives. So they get this greater understanding of where the accountant in public practice actually fits in the equation. And I think this will help you to be able to really introduce virtual CFO services to your clients. And your firm's going to benefit because you're going to be getting growth in diversified services as predicted by the ComBank Accounting Market Pulse Report. ESS Biz Tools, Business Advisory Services podcasts are now going to go into a recess for a few weeks. And we're going to return with our next podcast on Wednesday, the 12th of January. May I, on behalf of my team, take this opportunity of wishing you a very happy Christmas. And I trust that we will all be able to enjoy a uh, great 2022. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay safe. And we'll talk to you again in 2022.